Good morning and happy Sabbath. I want to welcome you to our church service this morning. As we come to now the message, I pray that this message can be um, a blessing to you. The message for today is entitled, Hope in Death. How can there be hope when we experience the pain and sorrow that comes with death? Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you can guide and direct us. As we worship you, Lord, as we come to the scriptures, we pray that we can receive a blessing from the reading of your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Death is hard. Have you ever encountered uh, losing a loved one? Have you ever been just living your normal day-to-day -day life and then you receive a phone call? You receive a phone call that someone near you has passed away. And you feel like you've been hit with a bucket of cold water. Have you ever lost a loved one? You, we, we, can, we understand as a, as a society that death has this tremendous impact in our lives. When we encounter death, people come together for funeral services. They come together to mourn the loss of a loved one. Now, I personally have gone through a life experience of losing someone that was very close to me. Just a few weeks ago, in, in, on March 7th, I was told by my wife to take a seat and to listen to this, re this really sad news that she had for me. Well, during the night, while my wife and I were sleeping, since we live in the, new Yor in, in the uh, East Coast in New York, I received a text message. My wife received a text message that my aunt Eva had just passed away. Now, for some people, aunts and uncles are those that you see during Thanksgiving. But my aunt Eva was someone that lived with my nuclear family at home for many years. My aunt Eva was someone that took me to church, someone that, that, that led me to understand who Christ was, was someone that exemplified what it meant to walk with Jesus. And my aunt Eva died from complications of lupus, an autoimmune disease that eventually led to her death. Her funeral was yesterday and I wasn't able to be there for several reasons. And I wasn't, and, and as, I, as I was watching the streaming of my aunt's uh, funeral service, my heart just broke. Now, some of us may have different ways to cope with death. Some of us may think, well, well, we're Christians, we have hope, and yes, we do, but it still hurts. You can be someone with a tremendous faith in the Lord and His soon return and still cry at a funeral. This weekend, as a country, as a society, many people are celebrating the death of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We call this holiday Easter. Now, I don't want to get into the, the, the pagan origins of the word Easter, what it means. Regardless of what you think it means, people are gathering together to worship the memorial of Jesus dying on the cross about 2,000 years ago. There are many Christians that only go to, the, to a church building during this holiday season. So I thought, as a pastor, when I present to you a message, how can I connect the resurrection of Christ with the overall framework of us Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Because we worship on Sabbath, many of us don't have the, 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 the allure of Resurrection Sunday. But can we still learn something from the Resurrection Sunday or Easter weekend experience. I believe we can. Please turn your Bibles to Luke 23, verse 44. Luke 23, verse 44. Luke 23, verse 44 says this, It was now about the sixth 
hour. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Here we encounter the narrative that Luke gives regarding the death of Jesus. It is very interesting to note that this text opens up with the idea that the, 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 the day was darkened when the sun hadn't even uh, set. That is to say that the, there was a lack of sunlight even when the sun was still in the air. Now many theologians have taken this text to think that this must have been an eclipse where the moon and the sun come to in a certain, uh, certain moment and they darken the skies. But we don't find that in the text because according to the lunar cycles in this day, it was impossible for it to be an eclipse. Could it be, church, could it be that right before the death of Jesus, all of creation was dampened, was sad, seeing the Creator on the cross. Could it be that instead of a sunny day, meaning happiness, it was a gloomy day because Jesus was on the cross? When you lose a loved one, the day does not seem the same. Food does not taste the same. Things that you enjoy don't feel as joyful. And what we encounter in this text is that the death has an incredible psyche, uh, impact on your psyche, on your mind. We need to understand that Jesus was on the cross, not because He was tied down and not able to loosen Himself, but because He was sacrificing His life for us. That Jesus was willing to put His life on the line for you and for me. What killed Jesus was not the whiplashes, was not the nails in His hands. What killed Jesus was a broken heart for humanity. The, te the text goes on to describe that, that, that the, the curtain in the temple of God was torn in half. This is referring to the inner, uh, the, inner, the inner temple of the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. And uh, if, you, if you don't have a proper understanding of the temple of, uh, of, of then, you're not going to really understand the text here. What, what, what separated the holy place from the most holy place was a veil. What separated the, the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, from the priest that was taking part of the services inside the temple was a veil. This veil was not thin. The veil spoken here is not a veil that can be easily torn. The veil that is mentioned here was a thick veil. It was a veil that was embroidered and heavy. The veil was torn when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus stopped all of the sacrifices of that day because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that the temple services were pointing to. We find that when Jesus died on the cross, it was a perfect sacrifice for you, for me, 
for all of humanity. This was a supernatural event taking place. It was not a random falling apart of the veil, of the stitching of the veil. This was a supernatural act to tell us that the sacrifice of Jesus is enough to stop the temple services. Jesus' sacrifice is enough for us. The scripture goes on to describe that Jesus says that he commits his spirit to God the Father. This is a direct quotation from Psalm 31 verse 5. And we find that Jesus is quoting a psalm that is talking about humility and submission to God. And Jesus here is referring to God the Father as all the Israelites referred to. God as, as a father, as a loving parent, as a loving protector, as a loving father. Jesus then here says, I commit my life to you. And yes, even to the point of death, I'm willing to put my life on the line for all of humanity. It's very hard humbling yourself. It's very difficult. It doesn't feel good. Many times we think that the sacrifice of Jesus was just like, well, let's get it done. Let's go. I'll put my life on the line. Done. But <laughs> it's more than that. Think for think of this for example when a lamb in the ancient Israelite in, in ancient Israel was brought to be slaughtered the lamb wants to fend for itself the lamb wants doesn't want to die the lamb doesn't know what's happening and yet the lamb is sacrificed not because the lamb wants to because the lamb has no other choice but Jesus he had a choice and he chose you. Jesus had a choice and he chose to lay down his life for us. We serve a God that is not willing to give up his life for us. We serve a God that is willing to put his li life on the line for all of us. He willingly went to the cross. Would you do that? Would you put your life on the line for someone that may reject you? <laughs> you wouldn't. In your right state of mind, you would say, no, that's not worth it. But in Jesus' state of mind, he said it was worth it. Brother and sister, God finds you worthy enough to lay his life for you. Are you willing to give your life to him? Jesus died, he gave up his, he stopped breathing his last breath, and a centurion notices. A centurion was a modern day police officer of then. A centurion worked for the Roman government. A, this centurion was given the responsibility of making sure that those that died on the cross stayed there, that no one interrupted this experience. The centurion here is not a Jewish um, individual. The centurion here is not a Sabbath-keeping person. The centurion here is not a what you would call a godly person. But here the text is telling us that the centurion also was witness to the sacrifice of Jesus. We believe in a God that literally walked on this earth. Jesus is not just a really pretty fable story. Jesus is a historical figure that we can find. And the centurion has no reason to make things up. The centurion has no bias to make it seem that someone uh, didn't die or so forth. The centurion is the first one to realize the gospel. That Jesus gave his life for the world. <laughs> How ironic that God would allow the first witness to Jesus' sacrifice to not be a church attender. God is working in our area. 
in our midst, even when we may think He is not. The scripture goes on to say, and that we just read, that, there was, that this was a great spectacle. People had come to this crucifixion scene, not because they are bored, there's no Netflix, there's no TV, so they go out to this scene of capital punishment. The scripture goes on to say that there were people there watching, and they were astonished. The scripture does not say that the disciples were there. The scripture does not say that those that were healed by Jesus were there. The scripture says that people arrived to the spectacle to see criminals being punished for their crimes. And they were astonished. They went back home and they were pounding their chest thinking to themselves, this person Jesus should not have given his life. Because he was not guilty. He was innocent. The scripture says that there's acquaintances in, the, in that same crowd. It's interesting to note that, that, that Luke here mentions that the people closest to Jesus on his, uh, uh, when he died were not his disciples, were not his inner circle. The people most closest to Jesus when he died were acquaintances, were people who knew of Jesus may, but may have not known him personally. They were, Jesus was, was surrounded by women as well. We find that, that most of the times, or many times, at the end of our lives, the people left around us may not be the ones that you expect. Wouldn't you expect the disciples to be there? Wouldn't you expect that, that, that the people that supported Jesus, the people that wanted Jesus, the people who benefited from Jesus would be there? They weren't. Unless you understand the historical context of then, you're not going to fully comprehend the situation. In the ancient world, around the time of Jesus, there were many messiahs. Some of you are going to be like, what? What is the pastor saying? What I'm saying is, there are many people, men, that were saying that they were the messiah, that they were sent by God. And many times, when these messiah-like people would come out of the woodwork, Many times they would start rebellions against the Roman government. And many times these messiahs would be killed. And that messiah who, was, who had the personality, who had the persona, who had the charisma of, of leading, when that person would die, that was it. I mean, how embarrassing would it be that you, you think this is the Messiah and you go and you spend time and you spend your resources, you tell people, and that Messiah dies. You don't, you don't want to be there. That's embarrassing. So we find that happening in this text as well. The people that were the most embarrassed of the sacrifice of Jesus were the people closest to Christ. Many times we think that only men can be, can lead people to Christ. But we find that women can too. And we find that women actually didn't, the women here didn't succumb to the pressures of their time. And they were still there near Jesus, even when it didn't benefit them. Let's continue reading. Luke 23, verse 50 to the end of the chapter. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud, and laid him in the tomb cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee 
followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared and, and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. Luke here is going to identify another character in the story. Luke is introducing a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And the text here tells us that Joseph was part of a council. Now, a council, what does that mean? Joseph was someone that was well educated in the scriptures. Joseph was someone that was wealthy. Joseph was someone that was successful. Joseph was on the same level of Nicodemus that we find described in John chapter 3. Joseph of Arimathea goes to the um, goes and um, is described as a man who is part of the council of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the religious courts, the courts of the Jewish people. We need to understand that in the ancient world, the Jewish people had their own judges, and they were rabbis, they were teachers, and the Sanhedrin did not like Jesus because Jesus was a threat to their power structure. We find that, Jesus, that, that, that Joseph was part of that council, and the scripture says that he was a good and righteous man. We find that, that, that Luke is, is giving us a good perspective into Joseph, because in order for Joseph to be part of the council, Joseph could not have accepted Jesus as the Messiah or as God. If he had, he would have been kicked out of the Sanhedrin. And actually, the spirit of prophecy in the book Desire of Ages tells us, it tells us that Joseph of Arimathea had never accepted Jesus when Jesus was alive. The spirit of prophecy actually tells us that Joseph of Arimathea thought he could do good for Jesus um, while being in the Sanhedrin. And the text tells us that, that Joseph did not want Jesus sacrificed. Joseph did not want Jesus crucified. And, 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 the, and the scripture goes on to describe that he went and spoke to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the person ruling on behalf of the, go the, the, the Roman government and is what gave the, the Jewish people the legal, the legal um, uh, approval to crucify Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea, he's an educated Jewish man who's also wealthy and well-respected. And he comes to Pontius Pilate, and, and Pilate listens he listens to Joseph and gives Joseph the ability to take Jesus' body. We find here that Joseph of Arimathea gave us the example that you can be well respected in your community even if you live a different and a different and a, and a holy life. You don't just have to be disliked by everybody. I feel that, I don't want to go on a tangent, but many times Christians think, well, not everybody's going to like me, and it's okay to be unlikable. <laughs> no, we find here that Joseph of Arimathea was well-respected, even by people who were not religious. And Pontius Pilate listens to Joseph. We need to understand back, this is back in the context of what we just mentioned earlier, that, that, that Jesus could have been just a Messiah that rose up and died. His followers were embarrassed, and that was it. But we find that, that, that Pilate doesn't want another controversy. Pilate wants this thing to be over with. Pilate wants this Jesus to just go to his tomb and just die. Just be there, dead. But Joseph is given... The, 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 he is trusted with, with the body of Jesus because Sabbath is coming. The, the, the Sabbath was approaching and Joseph wanted to give a proper burial to, 
to Jesus. And he goes and he takes his body quickly. Because the Jewish people had an understanding of Sabbath that is different than ours today. And if you're surprised by that, the fact they even drove a car is different. Many Jewish people that want to worship on Sabbath don't even drive cars. They just, they stop. Their life is totally stopped. And we, what we find here is that Joseph of Arimathea says, I want to stop, but I also want to protect and give Jesus a proper burial. So he grabs Jesus and puts him in a tomb that had not been used by anybody, that is carved out of a rock. And people, specifically the women from Galilee, witnessed Joseph putting his body there in the rock. What if I were to present to you that Sabbath is not just about us not working. Sabbath is not just about us coming to church. That Sabbath is about us remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. I've met many Christians who don't do secular activities on Sabbath who come to church, who stop their work schedules in order to honor the holy day, the Sabbath day, and yet have no idea how this con is connected to Jesus. The Sabbath and Jesus are not separate. They're one. The Sabbath reminds us. The Sabbath is not just about us not buying and selling, or the Sabbath is not just about us coming to church. The Sabbath is not just us, is not just about what we can or can't do. The Sabbath is a remembrance of what Jesus has done, church. You don't need to just celebrate on Easter the fact that Jesus died for us every week as a reminder that Jesus rested even for our salvation. <laughs> In our salvation, Jesus rests, and so should we. We should rest as a commemoration, as a memorial of what Christ has done for us. The Sabbath doesn't save you. You are saved by Jesus, and that is why you want to rest on Sabbath. Sabbath is a day that we rest in the grace of God. There are many people who are caught up with what you should do or not do on Sabbath. But you are missing, you are missing the forest for the trees. The Sabbath is a day that we rest. It is. It's very easy for the world to creep into your Sabbath experience and just choke it up, take it up. But the Sabbath is a day of self-reflection for what Christ has done for us. It, it, it's interesting being a pastor. Being a pastor um, is, uh, is, a, is a, it's a fun thing. and um, I really enjoy being a pastor. I've been pastoring for six years now. It's been a blessing. It's, been, it's awesome. It's been awesome. I, um, something, something that comes with being a pastor, and I'll just be honest with each one of you. you I, I, I try to be personable and just talk to you. I'm, not, I'm no better. I don't fly. I don't hover. Just a human, just like you. And it's interesting being a pastor and family. Um, I have a, my own family at home with my two boys and my wife. But my extended family, they're part of my life too. And my extended family, um, uh, they see me as the only pastor in the family. I have another uncle who's a pastor. He's a great uncle, so he's my grandmother's brother. Um, but for the, mo for the most part, I'm the only pastor. Uh, comes with his baggage, if you know what I mean. And um, when I was talking to Eva, I, I mentioned the story of Eva. Um, Eva had a really l rough last two years. Eva was diagnosed with lupus when she was 28. She lived 20 plus years with uh, lupus. Imagine your own body fighting itself. 
When we get sick, it's typically connected to a pathogen. It's typically connected to a virus. But what if your own body fought itself? Eva impacted my life a lot. She, she was someone that, that, that called me, that loved me, that asked me how I was doing. And a few weeks ago, I was having a really stressful day, stressful couple of days. And she called me when she was alive. This is a month, uh, more than a month ago, like two months ago. She called me and she said, Edgar. I said, yeah? She haven't talked to me. <laughs> and she says, I I'm at the hospital. You haven't called me. And it broke my heart. Eva had... Um, had a rough couple of, of, of months, of, of the last couple of months of her life, she was in and out of the hospital. And she would tell me, she's like, Edgar, I can't take this anymore. What, 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 what encouragement do you have for me? And boy, is that hard. For some reason, as I pastor people who are not, who I don't have a like, history with for like, since I was a child, it's different. You can give encouraging words, but... What can you tell someone that when you don't have a word to say that, 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 that can answer their, their problems, their, their medical problems? And, and this, I, I remember talking to Eva, she had kidney failure for several months. And she, she, she would tell me, Edgar, I believe that God can heal, heal my body. And I said, Amen. But there's another aspect of life. That we may go, we, we, we may die. That the Lord may lay us to rest, may allow us to just rest. And when, when she died, on the day that she died, the day after, when I found out, it hit me that, that she died, even though I, I saw it coming. And Jesus dying on the cross was a, such a impactful thing upon the entire world and for, 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 for all eternity. We're going to marvel at the fact that God in the flesh died for people who didn't deserve saving. But there's hope, church. There's hope. There is hope. Revelation 1.18 says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. In this text, we find that Jesus is introducing himself to John and he says that I died, that Jesus died, but he resurrected three days later. Amen. We worship a God that didn't just sacrifice his life, but he resurrected. And because he resurrected, he is coming again. Have you lost a loved one? Have you, uh, have you seen your friends and family suffer? Have you cried yourself to sleep? The, the Lord is returning to end that suffering. Jesus holds the keys of death and of Hades. If Jesus defeated death, that guarantees us that we will because of His own actions, because He is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior, not because we lift ourselves up into heaven, but because Jesus comes down and gets us and brings us up and He saves us from the wages of sin, which is death. At the end of the day, this Easter weekend is not just about His death. It's not just about being beat up. It's not just about suffering. The Easter, the, 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 the Good Friday, the Resurrection Sunday reminds us that God reigns even over death. Adam and Eve couldn't escape death. We may not escape death, but Jesus defeated death. And because of that, we have hope. My son, Lucas, he's a cute guy, little chubby guy, he's eight months, barely able to sit up. 
He loves eating, loves it. If you've seen photos of him, uh, you would see that it shows that he loves it. <laughs> I love that little guy, he gives us back, back aches. And when Eva was sick, um, I would try to encourage her, but how can you encourage someone that's such a, such a dire state? And I thought, babies, babies can lighten up the mood, okay? So I recorded a video of my son Lucas eating a mango. And Lucas, when he goes into food, he, he doesn't just eat, he devours. So he had a mango and he started getting the pit of the mango and just sucking on that pit and just, it was going in and out. And I remember sending this video and Eva said, wow, look at his, his, his uh, energetic self trying to eat that mango. The day before Eva died, I called her and she was eating a mango. This was Saturday night, she died Sunday night. She was eating a mango and she told me, Edgar, she's like, I'm eating this mango. She's like, I want to enjoy it just like Lucas does. <laughs> I'm just enjoying it. That was the last conversation I had with Heba. But you know what's the first conversation I'm going to have with her in heaven? When, because Jesus comes back and the resurrected in Christ will rise again when I meet her in the clouds, when we're in heaven, when we're enjoying some celestial buffet food, I'm going to get a mango. Find Eva and share it with her, with my son Lucas and I. And we're going to enjoy that mango, but it's going to be until heaven. May you put your trust in Jesus as your personal Savior. I can't make that decision for you. A church doesn't save you. You have to make a personal decision to give your life to Him. I pray that you give your life to the Lord. And because of His grace and His generosity, we'll find ourselves in heaven, reunited with all of humanity, celebrating the goodness of God and eating a delicious mango. I pray that you make this decision in your life today. Do you, do you want to accept Christ as your Savior? Do you want to follow Christ on a personal level? Do you want to recommit your life to Christ? It's our word of prayer. Lord, I pray that you can guide and direct us. I pray, Lord, that you lead us in everything that we do and that we can accept your sacrifice but also realize that you're coming very soon. May we spend time with you and may we love you the way that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.